Hey, everybody, this is Deb with Truthfication Chronicles. And yeah, we're going to talk about Sidney Powell in this one because I found some documents and I want to make sure that you see them too. And remember, I will put links to all the documents down below so you can read them on your own if you want to and you can share them with other people. So we're going to start out with this blog post here. And, you know, it's just one that I thought we needed to start with. So are General Flynn's prosecutors panicking? This came out on the 2nd of September. So I know it's a little old, but still, we have the same things going on. So the short answer to the title of this article, yes, Michael Flynn's new lawyer, Sidney Powell, is a honey badger. If you do not know anything about honey badgers, I encourage you to watch the documentary, Honey Badgers, Masters of Mayhem. They tear the testicles off of lions, and it sure looks like Ms. Powell is emasculating prosecutor Andrew Weissman. <laughs> That's where the title comes from. Sidney the honey badger, okay? So keep that picture in your mind. And it's rather vivid, but we're going to go to some documents and we're going to see her in action. Okay. Now, if you recall, I did do a video on this document right here, which was Flynn's uh, motion to compel production of Brady material. Now, if you remember, Brady material means the material that the federal prosecutors have that might possibly exonerate a defendant. OK, they are required by law to turn over any documents or any material they have that could be exculpatory for that defendant, because basically, well, she says here that the government has a crushing 95 percent or higher conviction rate. It is virtually impossible to defend successfully when the might and power of the federal government focuses on the destruction of an individual and the government holds all the cards. And that's the problem. So that's why this Brady material order was given, because that forces the prosecution to turn things over. And what she alleges here is that there are many things they did not turn over. And in fact, you need to also know that Sidney Powell has a history of working against Andrew Weissman. So she knows his tricks and everything. And because he was involved in the whole Enron thing and she was fighting for the people that, you know, he convicted and then it went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court overturned it like nine to zero. OK, so it was totally overturned the conviction that he got. And she said back then even that the biggest problem was he did not present the Brady material. And they were supposed to do that. Now, she also mentions the Ted Stevens case, which I did a video on that. It was part of the Louis Gohmert series. And if you've not watched those, you might want to see those because, wow, Louis Gohmert just nailed it, the whole thing. And I did one portion on Ted Stevens and the things surrounding him. And yes, that's what happened to him, that he was up for re-election and they kept back a bunch of stuff that would have shown he was innocent. And of course, then they waited until after the election for that to come out. So yeah, this is Andrew Weissman's MO, if you want to say it that way. He likes to do this, to hold things back and if they do happen to come out, they come out in, you know, timing where it was too late. And in that case, prosecutors kept back information that made it clear the man was innocent. And he was a Republican that had been like the the longest serving Republican at the time. And so it was really a huge thing, devastating to the man himself. But anyway, it's a very sad uh, story. And so... You can go and watch that. This document right here, we covered in a previous one. So that came out on August 30th. And then she sent off this on September 30th. Now, there was one in between, which was a minor one. It just had a few corrections and a little bit of clarification in it. So I'm not going to worry about that one. But this was a supplemental status report that just came out at the end of September. And she said it was at the court's request so I think that's really interesting. The court is being run by this um, Emmett Sullivan, who was the judge in the Stevens case, who forced them to produce the Brady material. So, you know, he really is a strong believer in 
being fair about that. Although he didn't do Flynn any favors because at one point in one of the proceedings, he called him a traitor and that he'd sold out his country. But then he came back after the break and apologized, basically. But of course, the mainstream media didn't cover that too well. Anyway, so this is a status report because there was this case, United States versus Rafikian, and that was one of the people that Flynn was working with. They were trying to get him for FARA violations. And that played a role in it because this just came out, the decision on this. And it was just, uh, Rafikian was just acquitted by the judge. And the judge's name was Anthony Trenga. And that was the Eastern District of Virginia. He granted the motion for acquittal in its entirety. And he also set it up so that if somebody challenges that or tries to vacate it, they will actually have to do an entirely new trial because the judge thought this guy was kind of railroaded and framed. So, he, you know, it was a very important decision because Flynn worked with this guy and the allegation she has is that these guys that were working with Mueller wanted to get Flynn to, you know, testify against this Rafikian and say that he, you know, falsified FARA documents and all of this, and Flynn refused to do it, which plays a role in this status report. And one of the reasons I want to include this, let me go down, it's on page four. I mean, there it's an interesting read if you want to see more about it, but really page four is where we get into things. And this just, we're going to hit this footnote in just a minute at the bottom of the page, but uh, this was just concluding that the information from Rafikian should play into what is going on with Flynn because it became obvious that the prosecutors did not treat Rafikian fairly. Okay. And so she says, remarkably, the government did not indict the specious Rafikian case until more than a year after the Flynn indictment just a few days before Mr. Flynn was to be sentenced in this court when the government was concerned that Mr. Flynn would withdraw his plea. Okay, now remember, an, uh, an indictment is not a conviction. An indictment merely says the person is likely guilty, and that allows for the court case. Okay, so they had this indictment, and they had it for a year and then just a few days before Flynn's supposed to be sentenced, all of a sudden, ta-da, now we put up the Rafikian case. So the timing of it was very, shall we say, coincidental. And those of you who follow the 17th letter of the alphabet, you understand that there are no coincidences. And especially when it comes to how Weissman runs things, there are not coincidences, but there are manipulated timetables. And that's really what he has done here. And of course, Weissman himself is not running this because the main prosecutor was this Van Grack. But even though Weissman wasn't actually there in the court, he was the one pulling the strings. Okay, he's the puppet master. So we know that he's behind a lot of this. And Sidney Ball tried once to get him on prosecutorial misconduct because he was holding back the Brady material back in the Enron thing, but she didn't get it through. But the judge was not necessarily a clean judge and didn't rule rightly. So anyway, even more troubling, Mr. Van Grack was determined that Mr. Flynn would testify in the Rafikian case that he had knowingly signed a false fire registration. Even though Mr. Van Grack knew that was not true, and Mr. Flynn had not agreed to that in the course of his plea agreement, Mr. Flynn's refusal to get on the witness stand and lie for the government on that point prompted a heated tirade from Mr. Van Grack with Mr. Flynn's lead counsel, in which Mr. Van Grack claimed Mr. Flynn had agreed to plead to a knowing an intentional false fire of filing. Okay, so you see there, Van Grack was saying, he's the government prosecutor, Mueller's guy, and he was saying, oh, but he promised he would do this. And Flynn's like, no, never said I would do that. Uh-uh, uh-uh. So in our endless document review, we now have a draft of the statement of offense that proves the contrary. Okay, so here we have evidence that they haven't received all the Brady material. And that's what she's pointing out here that, you know, 
they did not give him everything because they should have provided that because that draft right there tells you that they tried to set Flynn up and to get him to do something that he refused to do. And so the absence of that language from the statement or of offense or any charge of a false filing did not deter Mr. Van Grack from doubling down. Enraged that Mr. Flynn reject enraged that Mr. Flynn reject their demand to lie, the prosecutors in the, uh, the Eastern District of Virginia, and this was the Rafikian thing, retaliated with an ex parte gag order and sealed filing on July 3rd. For the first time, the prosecutors claimed that Mr. Flynn was a co-conspirator. They put Michael Flynn Jr. on the witness list for the Rafikian trial. Now, if you look down here, this was the one that was documented up above, but it fits in really well here. This decision renders meaningless the faro related section of the statement of defense in this case, which was the Rafiki in case they were talking about. However, it does not vitiate any of our Brady requests. Indeed, it only magnifies their significance in the overall government misconduct in this case. The government told defense counsel in the summer of 2017 that it was going to indict the Farah case then had obtained authorization to target Michael Flynn Jr., who had a newborn, and had seized all his electronic devices. Okay, so this is the situation that was going on, right? Okay, at this point, I'm going to skip over to this article by The Last Refuge, which is the conservative treehouse, and Sundance has been at it again, doing some pretty good stuff here. And if you go through this, now this is a really good article to read the whole thing, but I want to point out some things. Okay, here's the document we were just reading in the footnote that we talked about. And of course, here's Mike Flynn as a father, General Flynn. All of a sudden, they're claiming that he was supposed to testify against Rafikian. He refused to do so. And so then they turn around and they target his son, who just had a newborn baby. I mean, how's any father going to be feeling at this point? So there was definite pressure. And we've known about this. We've suspected this was the situation. And it's been rumored out there for a long time. But this is just absolute confirmation that's what happened. As highlighted, Michael Flynn, under pressure from Mueller's prosecutors, signed a plea to avoid his son, Mike Flynn Jr., being indicted or accused. As we suspected... General Flynn signed a plea deal to avoid seeing his son charged with a fabricated FARA violation. Okay, and that's very logical. You know, it was a, a father sacrificing for his son. Now, if you look at all this, um, I'm going to kind of scroll down. This is a long article, but I tell you, it is a really good article to read. Now, here is the document of the supplemental status report in case you want to see that. But here's the point that I wanted to make about it. A second expanded scope memo was issued by Rod Rosenstein to Robert Mueller on October 20th, 2017. The transparent intent of the second scope memo was to provide Weissman and Mueller with ammunition and authority to investigate specific targets for specific purposes. One of those targets was General Michael Flynn's son, Michael Flynn Jr., and if you look at it, here is where this is from, you know, he calls it the Weissman Report, which, you know, it really was the Weissman Report, although most people refer to it as the Mueller Report. However, after watching Mueller talk about it, he didn't have a clue what was in it. Anyway, so in this right here, this portion from it, on October 20th, 2017, the acting attorney general, that would have been Rosenstein, okay, confirmed in a memorandum the special counsel's investigative authority to as to several individuals and entities. First, as part of a full and thorough investigation of the Russian government's efforts to interfere with the 2016 presidential election, the special counsel was authorized to investigate the pertinent activities of Michael Cohen, Richard Gates, and we don't know who this is, Roger Stone, and look at this one, okay? But look, it has a little bit here. That's a junior right there. I'll bet you anything. And so the first redaction listed under personal privacy is unknown. However, the second related redaction is a specific person, Michael Flynn Jr. And we know because he had all these things seized. So we know that that's what happened to him. 
In combination with the October timing, the addition of Flynn Jr. to the target list relates to the ongoing 2016-2017 investigation of his father, General Mike Flynn, for one, possible conspiracy with the foreign government, two, unregistered lobbying, three, materially false statements and omissions on 2017 FARA documents, and four, lying to the FBI. So this request... From Weissman and Mueller, it just lines up so perfectly with when they were starting to really push Flynn on trying to get him to testify for them and to lie for them and to put in a guilty plea. Okay, so getting Rosenstein to authorize adding Mike Flynn Jr. to the target list in the scope memo meant the special counsel could threaten General Flynn with the indictment of his son as a co-conspirator tied to the Turkish lobbying issue, which they did, if he doesn't agree to the plea. So this was the situation General Flynn was in, and that was what happened. And so, of course, you know, Mike Flynn Jr. had a four-month-old baby. What's his dad going to do? What would any dad do, any good dad? And so that's what they ended up getting Flynn to agree to sign this. And then I have this document, too, that is the government's response. This is Mueller's prosecutor's response to Sidney Powell's motion to compel And so in this, they claim, oh, no, we gave everything, you know, we did all we were supposed to do. We did it right. And look, he said, you know, that I make this statement knowingly and voluntarily and because I am, in fact, guilty of the crime charge. No threats have been made to me, nor am I under the influence of anything that could impede my ability to understand the statement of offense fully. Okay, so what happens? If he says anything about them, if he says, yes, they did threaten me, what are they going to do? They're going to go after his son. You know they would. And so what was Mike Flynn to do? So he went ahead and signed this. And of course, his plea deal is much longer. And I have a video on his plea deal. It says in the plea deal, the part of his cooperation was he had to be participating in covert law enforcement operations. So yeah, he was busy doing things behind the scenes. But anyway, this is kind of like a Mark Dice here. But wait, it gets worse. Mike Flynn was under a fraudulently obtained FISA Title I surveillance warrant. Okay, this is the part I really need you to see, folks, because this hits it all. When the NSA, and by that I mean, you know, the organization, the agency, when they surveil people, they are actually surveilling foreigners. Okay, they're not supposed to surveil people within our country. And, uh, you know, Americans. But sometimes when they're surveilling foreigners, then it gets caught up. You know, some of the Americans maybe who are making deals with them get caught up. They can unmask those people's names if they have a good reason to. Now, the Obama administration did like 300 unmaskings, which was absolutely unheard of. That it was just so many more than normal. And so that by itself, you know, it's a whole nother part of this. But this whole system is called incidental collection. That's when the target is actually a foreign person. And then there's an American who is caught up in that. That is incidental collection. Okay. This is what we were all under the impression happened to Mike Flynn. But this isn't what happened to Mike Flynn. He was not under incidental collection. That's not it. And he was not unmasked because they didn't need to because he was under a FISA warrant. Now, this is huge, folks. It really is. If you didn't know this already, this is really a very important part of what's going on. Now, this has a video down here. I'm going to show you the first clip of it because then you'll understand a little bit more. This is Sally Yates. This was Lindsey Graham asking questions of Sally Yates and James Clapper about the process of, you know, the incidental collection and then unmasking. Oh, so let me play that clip for you. Let me ask you this. Did anybody ever make a request to unmask the conversation between the Russian ambassador and Mr. Flynn? And again, Senator, I can't 
answer a question like Mr. that that Clapper, we call do you for know classified if that information? The case? I don't. And I, Is I, there I, a way to find that out? Uh, well, in another setting, uh, it could be discussed. But there is a record somewhere of who sure. would make a request to unmask the conversation with General Flynn and the Russian ambassador. Well, I'm... Uh, if one was made, there'd be a record of it. I, d I can't speak to this specific case, but I can generally comment that in the case of 702 requests, yes. Uh, those are all documented. Okay, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but this is important to me. How did the uh, conversation between the Russian ambassador and Mr. Flynn make it to the Washington Post? Well, which one of uh, us are you asking? Ms. Sheik. Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah. Uh, uh, all of us I thought so. would like to know that. And I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Nor do I know the answer to that. Is it fair to say that if somebody did make an unmasking request, we would know who they were, and we could find out from them who they shared the information with? Is that fair to say? The system would allow us to do what I just described. Well, unmasking requests are not made to the Department of Justice. No, but to the agency who does the collection. That's my understanding. Is that so yes, there should there is a be a record somewhere in our system whether or not an unmasking request was made for the conversation between Mr. Flynn mm -hmm. and the Russian ambassador. We should be able to determine if it did, if it was made, who made it. Then we can ask, what did they do with the information? Is that a fair statement, Mr. Clapper? Yes. Okay. Okay, so the procedure is if some American is caught up in this incidental collection when they are monitoring what a foreign agent, a foreign person might be saying, then this person can be unmasked. And if they are, then there has to be a paper trail as to who requested that unmasking and they had to have given a reason why. Okay, from this exchange, that didn't happen. Okay, so, I mean, they didn't outright say it, but it appears from their responses that Flynn was not unmasked, and this is really important. Now, I have a second clip of this that I want to show you, too. I mean, you can watch the whole thing. You can watch it here, or I also, in down in the show notes in the description, I also put a link to the C-SPAN version. You know, I put a clip and it has the whole time that, that Lindsey Graham is questioning. It's about eight minutes long. So it was really a good line of questioning, though. Are either one of you aware of incidental collection by our intelligence community of any presidential candidate, staff, or campaign during the 2016 election cycle? Say that again, sir. I'm sorry. Was there any incidental collection where our intelligence community collects information involving a presidential candidate on either side of the aisle during 2015 or 2016? No, not to my knowledge. Okay, so really what we're finding out with all of this is that Flynn was not unmasked because... Flynn was being purposely surveilled, okay? And the only way that can happen is if he was the subject of a FISA warrant. So, here we go. It says, in the two and a half years following this testimony, there was nothing that would deliver the answer as to who unmasked General Michael Flynn, which is what I've been asking all this time because that should have been the first thing they looked at and the first person to be exposed and questioned even. But, oh no, that person, nobody ever provided a name. But it should have been easy to find, right? No, the reason is simple. Flynn wasn't unmasked because Flynn was under FISA court authorized active surveillance. Here's how we know. First, Lisa Page and Peter Strzok were watching that hearing where Senator Lindsey Graham was questioning Sally Yates and James Clapper. As they discussed in their text messages, the issue of unmasking is irrelevant. Incidental collection is the incorrect narrative. Look at this. They actually said it. Yeah. Clapper and Yates through Graham questions are all playing into the there should be an unmasking request record for incidental collection. Incorrect narrative. So yeah, they were just saying it there. 
It was an incorrect narrative because the collection was not incidental. Flynn was actively being monitored. Flynn was under an active Pfizer surveillance warrant. Second, more evidence of Flynn under active surveillance is found in the Mueller report, where the special prosecutor outlines that Flynn was under an active investigation prior to the phone call with Ambassador Kislyak. Yeah, that on December 31st, 2016, Kislyak called Flynn and told him that Flynn's request had been received at the highest levels. Okay, and then down here it says, Previously, the FBI had opened an investigation of Flynn based on his relationship with the Russian government. Yep, that's it. Right there. Previously. So, the big question now becomes, when did they start surveilling Flynn? And what was the predicate of that surveillance? Okay, now remember... Flynn was the head of the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, under Obama until 2014. And Obama didn't like the things Flynn was doing because Flynn was starting to see the corruption and deal with it. And Obama couldn't have that. So he ousted Flynn. And I think probably the surveillance of Flynn might go way, way back. So keep that in mind. If they were surveilling Flynn at the time of the campaign, remember the two-hop rule? The two-hop rule is not only can they surveil the you know person that that warrant is for when you get a FISA warrant, but they can also surveil anybody that person talks to and any person that person talks to. So that gives them all of these people. That is what... This suggests it was the reason for the 300 unmaskings that they were trying to figure out who all Flynn had been dealing with. And it also presents the problem that if they were watching everyone that Flynn talked to, he talked to Trump a lot. So you got to wonder if they got everything on Trump. And, you know, here it is. They were talking about that, too. These were a couple of testimonies that pointed that out. And Mary McCord was one of them. She was the assistant attorney general in charge. And that was, those of you who followed 17th letter of the alphabet, you know about John P. Carlin. And he went out right before the election. And then she stepped in. She was the acting assistant attorney general of the National Security Division at that time. She would have been the one to sign off on it if it was between October 16th and April 17th. Now, I think it very well could have gone all the way back through Carlin. It may even been before that. I'm kind of thinking that the Obama administration had Flynn under surveillance that from the moment he was ousted from his position at the DIA. I really think that's when it started. But did it start officially then? Maybe not. But there's somewhere along the line, there's got to be something about that. And then third, from the 2017 House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, when Devin Nunes was chairman, okay, the four targets of the Trump campaign under investigation throughout 2016 were outlined. And I've been saying this for a long time, folks. When the 17th letter of the alphabet came out and told us there were four FISAs, people said, oh, that's the Carter Page original one and then the three renewals. No, that's not what he was talking about. And it was George Papadopoulos, Carter Page, Paul Manafort, and General Michael Flynn. So there were four FISAs on people in the Trump campaign. And we know Papadopoulos was set up, Carter Page was set up, Paul Manafort was probably a plant, but he was kind of being set up way back through Ukraine and everything. So, um, yeah. And then Flynn. So those were the four. Because of the sensitivity of the matter, the FBI did not notify congressional leadership about this investigation during the FBI's regular counterintelligence briefings. So see, they were supposed to, the FBI is supposed to, protocol says, they have to inform the Gang of Eight, which the Gang of Eight are the Republican and Democrat leaders of the different, there's like the House Intel, the Senate Intel, and uh, I can't remember the other two right now. And so there's four Democrats and four Republicans on it. And they have special clearance so that they can hear 
things that are classified above the level of regular congressmen. So they are supposed to be informed of all of those things, no matter how sensitive. And that the FBI didn't do that, that was highly irregular. It was not something they should have done. So in real time, Lisa Page and Peter Strzok were saying the incidental contact unmasking narrative was incorrect. Then Devin Nunes outlines the targets of the 2016 FBI investigation, which included Flynn. Then Robert Mueller says Flynn was under investigation prior to the 12 16 phone call with Kislyak. Put it all together and there was never an unmasking request because the intercept was not incidental. And because the intercept was part of the FISA court granting a surveillance warrant. The lack of incidental collection is why FISA 702 doesn't apply and why there's no paper trail to an unmasking request. The intercept was not incidental because the intercept was the result of direct monitoring and the FISA court authorized surveillance being conducted on Michael Flynn. There are only three options, and these are the three options we have available. Incidental collection, unmasking request, but we know there was no unmasking request, so it could not have been incidental collection. It could have been a direct intercept legally because there was an active FISA Title I surveillance authority, and that's really what it was. And then it could possibly have been direct intercept illegally, active surveillance without a Title I authority. Now, that has nothing to do with whether the FISA was granted, you know, correctly if it was really um, warranted. But, you know, that's what Horowitz is going to be investigating. And that's why I think a lot of this is coming out now. And especially with Flynn taking on the prosecutors, because if it's found out that there was an active FISA Title I surveillance on Flynn, that's huge because that's very obvious that they never told him. OK, so they definitely hid that. And I can bet you anything those prosecutors knew about it. So if they knew about it, they did not provide that as Brady material. They're in big trouble. Yep. And when they, you know, if they don't provide it, if, it, if they're accused and convicted of prosecutorial misconduct, it's not just being disbarred. They will be imprisoned. Yay. Wouldn't that be nice? Oh, so anyway, all of the evidence from documents over the past few years indicates number two was the status, and that would be that he was directly being surveilled because they had a, an active FISA warrant. So that's something. The incoming National Security Advisor of President-elect Donald Trump was under active Title I FBI surveillance as granted by the FISA court. That's how the FBI intercepted the phone call with Sergei Kislyak and why there's no unmasking request. This doesn't deal with the propriety of the FISA warrant. Okay, like I said, doesn't doesn't deal with the fact that the FISA warrant was or wasn't obtained correctly. That is not what it deals with. That's what Horowitz is going to be dealing with. And so this very well could come out that they got, you know, we know for sure that the Carter page was done illegally because they provided a bogus information in the form of the dossier. And so that was not done correctly. So it could very well be that they trumped up some kind of weird little charge for Mike Flynn. And that's the same thing, which probably is what happened. And also for Papadopoulos and also for Manafort. So all four of them may have some interesting information coming at them. Additionally, this would explain two more issues. Number one, President Obama warning incoming President Trump not to hire Michael Flynn as his national security advisor. Well, we know Obama had no love for Flynn because Flynn knows where the bodies are buried, right? <laughs> and number two, a very strong possibility that Flynn's status is the redacted paragraph in the January 20th, 2016 Susan Rice memo. OK, so remember Susan Rice's memo, we call it the CYA memo, and it, everything had to be done by the book. It, well, there was this section here that was classified and it was redacted. So nobody knows what was in there. Is it possible it was talking about Flynn? Very possible. 
So that's what Sundance here believes. I would suggest the redacted section relates to President Trump being under FBI investigation and or incoming National Security Advisor Michael Flynn being under investigation and Pfizer surveillance, hence the issues with sharing information. While Michael Flynn being under active FISA court authorized surveillance would indicate there's no need for unmasking of Flynn, there would be a need for unmasking of everyone else captured within the Flynn surveillance. Hence the dozens of White House unmaskings identified by Devin Nunes in March 2017. Additionally, Flynn being under FISA authorized surveillance still doesn't excuse the leak likely by Andrew McCabe to the Washington Post about the phone contact between Flynn and Ambassador Kislyak on December 29, 2016. So anyway, this is the deal. You can go through and you can find out there was another, an FBI 302 written on January 19th, 2017, before the Flynn interview on January 24th about Kislyak. And you can see that this is the Mueller report and it was something from the grand jury, but it was dated 11917. So there was something. And it may be redacted and stuff, but anyway. And then that's something that this techno fog here, this tweet. Is there a previously unreleased FBI 302 of General Flynn that predates the 12417 interview with Peter Strzok? Yeah, so the special counsel mentions it. Yeah, good digging there, Technofog. Good job. And so. Anyway, that's what Sidney Powell is knowing. She knows all this stuff and she's trying to get to the bottom of it. So, yeah, it's definitely something that needs to come out. And when all of this does, it's going to be so obvious. So I did want to show you this. This is, like I said, the government's response to Sidney Powell's motion to compel and Really, it just basically is them trying to say, no, we did everything right until you get to page 30. And when you get to page 30, there's an attachment of a letter and it's really worth reading the letter. Here it is. It's from Sidney Powell. And this is before she technically was Mike Flynn's uh, lawyer, but she was like almost. I mean, he had already decided to hire her. And so this was June 6th of 2019. It goes to Barr and it goes to Rosen, who was the deputy attorney general. So this is after Rosenstein had left. Anyway, this is a letter that basically says, hey, here's the deal. I'm coming into this and there really needs to be some stuff done to restore our rule of law because these people have run roughshod over my clients, you know, rights. And so she's talking about how they need to provide the different things, you know, the different items that she was asking for. And these are the things that she was requesting. One of the first things is the appointment of new government counsel with no connection to the special counsel team of attorneys or agents to conduct a review of the entire Flynn case. And so that could be very interesting if you get somebody else in there. Now, I don't know what Barr has done with this, but, you know, he's he's got a lot on his plate right now. Anyway, um, yeah, it, the, all of these are really good things that she's pointing out. And she mentions Ted Stevens here and then she goes through and talks about, you know, General Flynn and why he would have, you know, given up. Well, this was where Judge Sullivan accused him of committing treason and then came back after a short break in the court proceedings. The judge returned to the bench and made something of a retraction of his most egregious choice of words. However, severe damage was done. The press ran wild with the treason suggestion unabated for an hour, and it morphed into days of media speculation about General Flynn, the president, the Mueller probe, and treason. So anyway, um, she put, makes some really good points in this, but then she goes on and she talks about, uh, and she was asking for a little more time. I think everybody knows that by now that she had asked for 90 more days because she was needed to get up to speed on some things and she needed a uh, security clearance to be able to view some of the stuff. So anyway, she goes through this and when you get near the end here, here are the things that she's asking for the individual uh, Brady material that she believes there is. And, you know, she makes very detailed um, requests here. It's not that she's just like saying, I want all material on this. 
No, it's that we have information that the British embassy delivered a classified document shortly after Trump's election to the PTT, likely also to Susan Rice and perhaps to others that destroys Steele's credibility, disavows him and declares him untrustworthy. It w apparently went into the safe for the PTT office and special counsel made clear it was aware of and very concerned about this document, it was told by a witness with personal knowledge about it, yet special counsel did not even take notes about the document. Notably, there's no mention of it in the Mueller report. So she knows stuff, okay? She knows things and she's asking for very specific items. Now, what I find really interesting, these are really good to go through, by the way, what I find interesting is that this was labeled confidential to the AG and the deputy AG. How did the prosecutors get a copy of it? Who gave them the copy? That's what I wonder. But, you know, somehow, because this is, remember, this is an attachment in the prosecutor's file that they, they sent this saying, we don't need to give her any Brady material because we've already given her all the Brady material. And then she's pointing things out like that. And it's like, no, they didn't give you that. They didn't give you a lot of things. So it's really kind of weird that they attach this letter because the letter kind of shows up that everything, you know, the 30 some pages before it are all like bogus. So anyway, um, there are so many things here. They want transcripts, recordings. And of course, you know, it goes on and on and on. I mean, it really does. You know, they had hidden the struck page text messages and um, then the targeting. Flynn Jr., who had a four-month-old baby, was required to produce his phones and computers. Suddenly, General Flynn was threatened with the public arrest search of his home, the indictment of his son, the Manafort treatment, etc. So, you know... It was a setup. It was so set up. And of course, you know, the guy that ruled on Flynn was Judge Contreras. And then like the next day, he just recuses himself. And then on December 2nd, WAPO published an article exposing that Strzok and Page had made politically charged texts disparaging Trump. But notice it didn't come out until the second. Yeah. Don't you think they were probably told that they needed to wait until Flynn signed? I don't know. Anyway, it just, when you read this, it kind of makes you ticked off that they're doing this. And of course they were asking for all these things. Then there's one down here that, um, yeah, they claim that, oh, here it is, that McCabe said this phrase. So, yeah. Um, he said those words supposedly during a senior attended FBI meeting video conference and she wants any evidence that might confirm that. Now, of course, the prosecutors have said, oh, no, no, that's been discredited. But we've heard that before, right? So that's why she's asking for new people to be put in there so that, you know, they can deal with some honest prosecutors. I don't know if that's going to happen, but it sure would be nice. So anyway, that's what she's asking for. There's like there's a ton of them that she's asking for. And so they're very specific. It's not like she's just saying, oh, give us everything. But, you know, like new information on the special counsel's destruction of the cell phones of Struck and Page. Wouldn't that be nice? You know, were any recovered from any source? The NSA, do they have any of it? You know, there are things that should have been asked for and they weren't. And, you know, evidence that Clapper specifically targeted General Flynn for removal, destruction, and on whose orders. Yeah. Well, you know, the prosecutors are saying a lot of the stuff she's asking for has no bearing on his case. But it really does. You know, they all do. So anyway, that is her letter. Again, it's at the end of the government response. So I'm not sure why they would have included that. And I don't know who gave it to him. Maybe Barr did. But somehow it was labeled confidential and ended up in the hands of the prosecutors. Kind of odd. But I am going to leave this for you. I'm going to leave a link to the Technofog thread. And then this is the article that the Honey Badger guy wrote up and, uh, you know, a little bit updated. He said, a few weeks back, I wrote about Honey Badger, Sidney Powell's legal brief 
demanding Brady material, i.e. information that is possibly exculpatory that must be turned over to the defendant and his legal team. The prosecutors, and there they are, submitted their response, and instead of a measured, well-reasoned brief, they opted for outrage, anger, stonewalling, and obfuscation. Yeah, that's pretty much it. About 29 pages of that. Most importantly, they admit that the government did not believe General Flynn lied. Let me repeat that with emphasis. The government did not believe General Flynn lied. But despite that material fact, the government charged Flynn with lying and coerced him into signing a plea in order to keep the feds from ruining his son. Okay, so this goes through and kind of gives you a little overview on that. I thought it was something that you would like to read as well. So it does a little more in depth on the government's response. So anyway, don't forget to do this because we're, get oh, look, we made a thousand. Woohoo, woohoo. So keep spreading it. We've got a long way to go, folks, before October 29th. So we really got to get this done. Share it, share it, share it. And I want to thank you, those of you I've seen sharing it on Twitter. You guys are doing a really great job. So put it on Facebook again, put it on Twitter again, and we're going to get the word out there. So that's what I've got for you on this one. I want to thank you for stopping by and I'll see y'all later. Mm -hmm.